This is 99 Novels, a podcast by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. In 1984, the writer Anthony Burgess selected his 99 favourite novels in English since the outbreak of the Second World War. Never short of an opinion about books, Burgess's list is typically idiosyncratic and invites closer attention, so we've invited some of the leading scholars, critics and writers to tell us more about each of the 99 novels. So read along with us as we explore a reading list created by one of the most original literary voices of the 20th century. In this episode, we're heading to Mexico to discover Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano with poet, translator, editor and literary titan Michael Schmidt. Under the Volcano traces the protagonist, Geoffrey Furman's last day. Furman is the ex-British consul of Cuanhuac, also known as Cuernavaca, a Mexican city in which the British have very little political interests. Furman spends his time drinking in the local bars and cantinas, thinking about his estranged wife, who may have had an affair with his brother, Hugh. The novel is set on the Day of the Dead festival in November 1938, during which Furman is visited by his wife and his brother, who offer the possibility of salvation from his alcoholic decline. As the trio spend the day together, their uneasy alliance is threatened by Furman's drinking, his suspicions and his desire to vanish deeper into the Mexican countryside. As events unfold in the shadow of the volcano Popocatapetl, it quickly becomes apparent that Furman has no interest in saving himself. Malcolm Lowry was born on the Wirral Peninsula near Liverpool in 1909. At the age of 19, he left home to work on a freighter, which inspired his first novel, Ultramarine, which was published in 1933. After gaining a degree in English from Cambridge University, he spent time in London where he met Dylan Thomas. After the breakdown of his first marriage, he crossed the Atlantic and explored the United States, Mexico and Canada. Throughout his life, Lowry was plagued with alcoholism and eventually died from related causes in 1957. Michael Schmidt, born in Mexico City, is a poet, literary historian, translator and editor. His most recent book of poems, Talking to Stanley on the Telephone, appeared in 2021. His major critical undertakings include Lives of the Poets, The First Poets, the novel, a biography, and Gilgamesh, the life of a poem. Michael is the founder, editor and managing director of Carcanet Press and general editor of PN Review. He is currently a professor of poetry at the University of Manchester. For all the relevant links and a list of all the books mentioned, head to the description of this episode. I'm Graham Foster and I spoke to Michael Schmidt at the offices of Carcanet Press in Manchester in September 2023. Thanks, Michael, for joining us on the 99 Novels podcast. Uh, today we're talking about Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano, uh, a novel that, that you have plenty to say about, I'm sure. But first, we, we like to get you to sort of describe the novel for people that might, might not have read it. So what's this novel about, basically? Uh, it's about a host of things. I think it, it is, um, it's a novel which isn't sure whether it's going to be a novel or a poem. And uh, the language uh, wavers between a kind of realism and a kind of uh, poetic involvement and complexity, which reminds you a little bit of Dylan Thomas at his least clear. <laughs> uh, it's a novel about alcoholism. It's a novel about escape. It's a novel about love. Uh, and it follows the life of one particular character uh, really through to, to the end. It's not a novel that ends cheerfully, and it's not a novel that progresses very cheerfully. In fact, it's it's quite a depressing book, and I can't, for the life of me, remember why I loved it as much as I did when I read, read it early on. Um, but it's I mean it's a very mighty novel, very powerful, and and it's I'm not surprised that Burgess chose chose it. 
Yeah, it's certainly unique. I mean, mm. I've not read anything like it at all, really. Well, the thing it reminds me of in retrospect is something like, oddly enough, like Moby Dick. Um, it's a novel which is always on the brink of going allegorical on you. Also, a lot of it is written, in, 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 and Moby Dick was as well, is written in iambic pentameter which is really weird because you're reading along and you suddenly think, oh, I've strayed into a Jacobean or, or even Elizabethan drama. And uh, the, obviously when, Moby, when, when Melville was writing Moby Dick, he'd suddenly discovered Shakespeare. He'd, there was a new edition of Shakespeare in, in large type and he'd read him at school in very tiny type, those little two, two column editions. And he wrote to Hawthorne and said, at last you can see why Shakespeare is Shakespeare. The, the wonderful musket of the T across the, you know, the top of the T across the... Uh, the foot, and uh, he just, he was totally obsessed with Shakespeare. So almost the whole of Moby Dick is in a kind of sprung iambic pentameter, just a wonderful run. And there's an awful lot of that in Lowry. But there's also an awful lot of Joyce in Lowry. And the more you read him, I mentioned Dylan Thomas, the more you find that, oh, ah, Lowry must have been reading this at this particular point. So the end of chapter four, I guess, it, 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 you're, you're in the territory and in the rhythm of Joyce's, uh, uh, the, you know, the dead in, 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 in Dubliners. It's just amazing how, how much he, he is parroting other writers. So I think if you know your English literature, you'll, you'll get an awful lot more out of this book. And it won't necessarily be positive because you'll think, my God, he's, he's, um, he's parroting. He's not, uh, he's not uh, imitating. You know, he's... <laughs> Perhaps we'll, we'll speak a little more about, about the, the sort of literary links yeah. of the novel a bit later on. When Burgess was writing his list in 1984, what was the novel's reputation at that point? It's hard for me to say. Um, it, it is a novel which I read in 1969 when it was given to me as a birthday present by a dear friend of mine at, at, Har at Oxford, um, Gareth Reeves. And I think Gareth Reeves' father, James Reeves, who the anthologist and poet, may well have known... Uh, Lowry at some stage. I think Gareth gave me the book because it tied in with my own childhood in 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 Cuernavaca, in in Mexico, and um, so it it had a kind of cult following in in the late sixties, certainly early seventies. And I would imagine it it had, had it. I think it must have continued. I think it still has a bit of a cult following. I know that there are academics in Liverpool who dedicated their whole imagination or imaginative space to it. Um, but I don't think it has quite the same pull as it did in 84 because it is such a hard novel to read. I suppose in 1984 as well, the film had sort of freshly come ah, out yes, as well. Yes, that's so. right. Yes, of course. And that may have been why Burgess... The, 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 there is something Bur Bur Burgessy about it in terms of the inventiveness and the fullness of the language. I mean, it's, it's clearly a novel that's invested in language. Uh, and everyone was talking about it because of the film, which was a tremendous movie. It's also it's also a novel where a British writer is writing about other cultures, which yes. is sort of catnip for Burgess, really. That's I right. Guess. So you you briefly mentioned when you first read Under the Volcano in 1969. What did you first make of it when when you first read it? Well, what surprised me is the the passages set in Cuernavaca, where I spent a lot of my childhood. Um, I convalesced there from rheumatic fever for a long time and was the absolute correctness of the description. I don't mean that it was accurate, but it really evoked the center of, of Guernavaca, the, the dip, the, you know, the valleys and the, and the architecture of the town. Um, and, and in my later years, having a, a partner from Oaxaca, uh, the, the later scenes set in Oaxaca were similarly uh, real in terms of the actual geography of the place, as I knew it. Of course, both Cornavaca and Oaxaca are now much changed. Um, and But some of the places that Lowry went, you know, survived until quite recently. Um, that one or two of them may still survive in Cornavaca. I've not been back there recently. So I think the first thing that's, that um, it did to me is it, it opened up my memory to areas that I hadn't thought about nearly enough for a long time. And you've written about Under the Volcano lots uh, throughout your life uh, you've returned to the novel for for example the 1999 penguin modern classics edition you wrote the introduction for that and in your 2014 survey of the novel the big the big book entitled the novel how did revisiting the book at these intervals compare to your first reading uh, i think each time i've reread the novel um 
I've become more and more impatient with it. And I think the impatience has to do with the fact that there were so many things in Lowry's own mind that were unresolved as he wrote it. And I don't think he ever really felt that he'd finished it. I think it was so many projects that were in a way cobbled together and uh, brought under the under the cloud, if you like, of this, this one particular character. So I think it's it, the kinds of failure that it um, that it achieves are also very ambitious. <laughs> so you know, it had a huge it had a huge um, mouthful, and I never quite I either spat it out or or swallowed it. Um, <laughs> So, yes, I've, I've become more and more impatient with it, I think is the word, yes. Also, what really strikes me about it, sentence by sentence, is that it doesn't seem to have been properly edited. You know, there are sentences... I, I was just looking through it this morning, and there was one sentence that leapt out at me, and at the top of the page I've written, what does this mean? And the sentence is, the consul had now finished his glass of flat beer... He sat gazing at the bathroom wall in an attitude like a grotesque parody of an old attitude in meditation. So all sorts of things are going wrong syntactically in that sentence, which I think an editor would have said, Lowry probably didn't like to be edited. In fact, I'm sure he probably hated being edited. But if somebody said to him, this is nonsense, um, he would possibly have responded to that. But, um, I mean, Lawrence, who was also in Mexico, uh, enjoyed being edited, I think. He he accepted a lot of, well, I say enjoyed is probably the wrong word, but he accepted a lot of editorial work on his books, not just cutting out bits that were a bit dicey in terms of the censor, but just bits that he realized were were superfluous. I don't think, I mean, I think maybe Under the Volcano is a book of darlings, which really should have been <laughs> killed, or some of them anyway. You know. That example that you read, there's loads of, those sort of things throughout throughout the yeah. book and you could sort of generously interpret it as he's trying to dramatize what the alcoholic mindset is yeah. with all these sort of non sequiturs and the syntax mm. and, and that sort of thing but uh, it struck me as as Lowry is not a writer that flows onto the page no. it's, it's a very anxious novel it, mm. the words seem sort of placed gr a great sort of struggle is happening in Lowry's mind mm. and those, and you can see that as you read the novel your your mind is sort of fighting against the words on the That's page right. in a lot of the time yeah. but but one of the the things that we both talked about is that it's renowned as a very difficult book difficult to read difficult to understand mm. we, we touched on this briefly but what do you think is the core of what makes it so difficult i think uh, if if you compare it with joyce joyce i think always knew what he was doing what his relationship was to the language and what his relationship was the the narrative elements in the language and my sense is that is that lowry was never quite sure and this uncertainty is manifested you you were talking about uh that particular sentence that i read being in some way characteristic were the novel told, as it were, spoken in the voice of the protagonist rather than in the voice of the narrator, those things would work dramatically. They would be, you know, they would be uh, embodiments, if you like, of his state of mind. But, but it seems to me that the, the subject of the novel is not his characters, but is the author himself. And th maybe that's the unresolved thing that he made somewhere along the line, well, probably very early along the line, though he redrafted so often that he had chances to change his mind. He took the wrong narrative route in choosing the third-person narrator. You know, it, it might it might conceivably have worked better with a first-person narrator or with two or three uh, first-person narrators, you know, telling it together. I guess people lo love, once you've had a, a really difficult novel like you know, Ulysses or even more Finnegan's Wake, you know, it's probably exciting to come on another one that's really challenging. But with those, you can resolve the challenges or you can, you know, you can go deeper into the challenges and they keep, they keep yielding. Whereas this one, you go, the deeper you go, the more confusing it, it becomes. It is funny when you look at the great modernists, when you look at, when you look at uh, Gertrude Stein, for example, the more you look at Three Lives or whatever it happens to be, the, the, the deeper you go and the more you understand her understanding of the challenges of language and and the whole mimetic process of language. Um, uh, maybe, maybe Lowry needed a week with Gertrude and Alice in Paris instead of 
<laughs> instead of a long time in a bar in Oaxaca on Cuernavaca. Yeah, or an island or in an Canada. Island. <laughs> yes, in Canada. Yeah, it's the the narrative style strikes me as a sort of Mrs. Dalloway type of thing where the the third person narrator is sort of jumping into different characters to narrate scenes from different points yes. of view. But it's not quite as clear as as Mrs. Dalloway is. You, you don't often, when you start a new chapter, you don't often know who's speaking until sort of the third or fourth page That's in that right. chapter. That's right. So um, there's a lot of work that you, you have to do as the, the reader. A comparison with, with um, Virginia Woolf is interesting because there's a real clarity of conception with her, isn't there? Mm. Uh, in all the work except for The Waves. I always think The Waves is, a, a, she let herself go in The Waves in a way which is structurally disastrous. Did did um, Burgess choose the waves as one of his? There's no the there's no... All, the wolf novels all appear outside the timeline uh-huh. of. Oh, I see. Yes, yeah. it's, it's 1939. the, ah, yes, of the first year. Yeah, yeah. Again, I I think probably um, the thing that ultimately tells against uh, under the volcano is the fact that it is an incredibly literary experiment. It's so deeply rooted in. Uh, in modernisms, different modernisms, uh, and uh, in the voices of the great writers who wrote before him. And I would imagine that some of his frustration as a writer is the sense that he's not on, he's not going to be able to achieve the scale that they achieved in their writing, the scale of uh, accomplishment and closure. I think the death of his, his protagonist is, is a real, you know, it's, it's basically throwing up his hands and saying, you know, I'm not worthy as it were yeah i I, th- I think in terms of reading the novel when you compare it to some of the the more well-known modernists you're right in that this doesn't seem to be as crisp as as some of their writing even joyce is sort of more sentence by sentence more more of a, a sort of precise writer than, than Lara. I think Joyce is always hearing voices as well. I mean, voices of people, people who have accents and who have, and there's not, is there, I mean, I, I should really reread the book again, though I don't think I ever will be able to do that. Um, uh, is there a differentiation of dictions between the different characters? Obviously you have the characters who are Spanish speakers and speak in kind of uh, Spanglish or whatever they call it uh, these days. Um, but with the primary characters, do you get this sense of, differentiated certainly language. certainly not in the narration no. um because the first chapter is narrated by a frenchman mm. um but in the dialogue his dialogue is sort of different mm. you can tell he's not a native english speaker in yeah. his dialogue but the consul the consul's brother and yvonne the, yvonne. Con- the consul's wife all speak in the same way mm. Which you can understand with the brothers, but the wife is from America, yeah. not not uh, yeah. the northwest of England as the brothers are. Yes. So, you know, you would expect her to have a, a different yeah. a different way of speaking, but she doesn't no. really. Which is interesting. When you look at Lawrence, he does differentiate the dictions of his different characters. And also in Lawrence, you get a very strong sense of class distinction, which, again, I don't think you particularly get in, in Lowry. They're all sort of posh. <laughs> they're all, <laughs> no, really. they're, well, they're they're all yes, lapsed posh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something we may have may have uh, touched on before, but but you've said in in your introduction to the Penguin edition of Lowry that he struggled to find his style, uh, and in the act of writing the novel, struggled sentence by sentence. Do you think those struggles are, are evident in the finished novel? Um, we've talked about that briefly, I suppose, but but how how do they manifest in the in the right the writing? Well, often he will um, he he will start with a, a metaphorical construction, and then within the metaphorical construction, he'll do a like. So this metaphor is like another metaphor, like that passage, that little tiny passage I read, where you have it looking at like somebody doing this who was like something else, and uh, you move away from the real world or from even the experience of of the person in the real world in a, in a, in a distressed state. Um, you, and as you were suggesting, maybe this is moving further and further into the consciousness of alcoholism. Maybe this is how you move out. But again, if the voice isn't assigned, 
And if you're, if you're watching someone doing, if you're watching someone going into a deeper and deeper alcoholic uh, state, you would probably not describe them in those terms. It would be their experience rather than your experience of them. I don't know. It's, um, it's I think that's the, the, the struggle never resolves. I, do, I there are there are those little moments of repose in the book, like when when Herman is looking out and he sees the volcanoes. Um, he sees he's tasi waddling popo katepa and causing the perfect marriage or something like that, and that's actually a moment of great clarity, and a real beauty of observation. Also, it's ironic because of course they are not a couple. It's the story about them uh, that that entrances him. Um, but those moments are not numerous. There, there are some very clear pieces of description mm. that sort of leap out of the text. Yeah. There's, there's a point where they're on a bus journey and they, they find a, an injured uh, right. Mexican yeah. by the road and the bus stops and they all get out, which is described very, very clearly. Yes. And, and subsequently, there's a, a sort of bullfight scene the bullfight's very where clear. Hugh, yeah. the consul's brother, sort of what can only be described as surfs on the back of a, yes. a bull. Um, <laughs> and, and they're very, very astutely uh, dramatised in the novel, I suppose. Yeah. And I, I wonder if, if the clear points are things that Lowry himself has witnessed in Mexico. That's interesting. So that when, when, when it's not his imagination at work, but when it's his observation at work, he achieves... That a, a kind of clarity that's not present in the other. That's that is likely. Yes, I guess that is probably likely. Also, those moments occur when he's not particularly when when drunkenness is not the main theme. I guess I think the kind of concern with alcoholism is, or with with the, with the alcoholic uh, person and the alcoholic uh, the effect of alcohol on vision, uh, in both senses of vision, not only sight but also uh, having a vision. Um, that concern uh, overwhelms those moments of, of lucidity that are, are really very powerful. That I think probably asking, when, going back to an earlier question you asked, um, you know, what was, what is was my initial impression? I think when I first read the novel, probably my excitement was at those moments of great clarity. There's a description of a of a a place in the center of Cuernavaca where we, we, as when I was a little boy, we used to go there and, and have meals. And it's a very, very accurate description of how it was when I was a little boy. Of course, I was a little boy probably 25 years, 20 years after he was there. So it won't have changed very much because things didn't change that fast in Mexico at the time. But, um, and in Oaxaca too, when you walk in the center, which is still much, I mean, tourism and, and gentrification have, um, have had their effect, but it's still much as it was when he was there. Certainly, the layout of the streets hasn't changed, and some of the old buildings that he he frequented haven't changed. You, know, you could go to the bars that he went to uh, until recently. The farola was was still open, but it's not now. I was sad to see when I last visited. Um, it, so, in a way, those those places still remain real and uh, accountable, if you like, against the novel. Okay, I mean, you mentioned your own experiences of Mexico, and and for British readers, I suppose this is one of the big two novels about Mexico that they would they would approach first um, before any any sort of Mexican literature, perhaps. Which which are the other ones? Um, the Power and the Glory by Graham Greene. Um, well, there's a Plume Serpent by Lawrence. Of course, and Lawrence as well. Yeah, yeah. and. There were a couple. Yes, I think you may be right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. If if under the volcano is is one of the first mm. books about Mexico that British readers would experience, um, does the novel accurately represent the Mexico that that you you saw in your youth, uh, particularly Cuernavaca mm. um, and Oaxaca, specifically, and the Mexican culture more more generally? I I think probably it it reflects what a foreigner imagines to be the culture. I don't think it's very close into the actuality of, of the cultures. Oaxaca is a, an amazing state and an amazing city where there are uh, a, a confluence. There is a confluence of different uh, indigenous peoples. And it's a very diverse, in, in our contemporary sense of the word, state where everyone may look alike, but they have tremendously differentiated backgrounds and often differentiated languages. I mean, there's still 11, 12... 20, I don't know how many languages of Zapotec, Mistec, bits of Nahuatl and Spanish spoken in, within within 
you know, 20 miles of each other, villages that are Sapoteks, villages that are Mistek, and different dialects of those languages. He doesn't get close to, I don't think, that diversity. And that is the nature of Oaxaca. And, it, and the other thing that you get in The Power and the Glory uh, that you don't get in Under the Volcano is a strong sense of the religion. Um, the, the religious coloring in Mexico is found everywhere. Um, you, you have the revolution, of course, which tried to exp expunge it, and he was there after the revolution, but you still had this really strong Catholicism, um, which obviously Green went for. That's what he. one of the things that really intrigued him. Um, and in a way, it's one of the things that, that attracted and repelled Lawrence about Mexico as well, this, the, this, the continuing presence despite the revolution of the church. Um, and in a way, you don't get too much of that, do you, in Under the Volcano? I'm just trying to think of church, churchy bits, aren't any? It's not a very no. religious novel. Although, I mean, Lowry has said that he, he based it on Dante's Inferno. Yes. So <laughs> perhaps that's where his religion uh, yes. lies, in hell rather than in churches. Yes. There is a wonderful phrase they still use in, in Oaxaca, which is, um, drink until you see the cross. And that's because they used to serve mezcal in little glasses, which were the glasses that the votive candles were in. And each one has a little cross on the bottom. So you, you drink your poisonous mezcal, you know, your, out of these little glasses. And when you look at the bottom of the glass, you can see the cross. So it means knock it back, drink till you see the cross. I think that actually does occur, doesn't it? Somewhere in the novel, I somehow remember somebody saying that to him. I may just be adding that in as a kind of a Lowry adjunct. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember myself. If I had read it, I probably wouldn't have yeah. known what it meant. In terms of literature about Mexico in totality by Americans, by British people, by Mexicans themselves, where, where do you think Lowry fits in in his, in his descriptions of Mexico and, and Mexican culture? I, I think he probably is one of the people who's created some of the, the lasting, um, I, I don't want to say cliches because that's degrading. I mean, one of the lasting um, archetypes of Mexican culture. I think the notion of the Mexican as a, a very heavy drinker, I mean, many Mexicans are, the, the notion of a culture that is torn between extremes, um, I think that that is pretty well uh, borne out by, um, or, or indeed, um, yes, augmented by by the nature of his writing. And it may well be that, what I was trying to talk about earlier, the, the kind of parroting of styles, the kind of use of such diverse styles. Mexico is obviously a country which was colonized, was, first of all, was very diverse, and then was colonized by the Spanish and has latterly been semi-colonized by the Americans, you know, and, and the French, of course, invaded and conquered it and, and were thrown out. Um, uh, it's it, that sense of diversity and that sense of uh, of confused cultures, or some of them enriching, and some of them impoverishing native cultures. Um, that's somehow embodied in, in his own strangely confused and confusing practice of writing and psychologizing. Um, I don't think that was his intention, but I, I I do think that if you read the novel, if you read it innocently without without too much stylistic expectation, you, you get a huge amount out of it. Uh, and it, 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 it's a landscape of dreams and a landscape of, um, well, nightmares um, and hangovers. As a friend of mine, John, John uh, McAuliffe said to me this morning, he said it, he could almost taste the hangovers when he, when he read the book. You know, it was... Um, it was yeah, <laughs> the, the scene where he's sort of hungover and drinking strychnine yes. to, to try and get him to stop <laughs> drinking again That's is, right. is uh, it's scary. sickening. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. We, we've talked uh, about the, the, difference, the different sort of methods of, of how Lowry uh, tells his story. And the novel strikes me as very elusive, particularly when it comes to other works of literature, mm. which we, we've talked about briefly before. Do you think in some ways this is a novel that, that is primarily in conversation with other novels? Well, you mentioned Dante. I think it's a novel that's primarily in conversation with other literature. I think it's in, in conversation very much with uh, the apocalyptic poetry of, of, of his period. It was his period, wasn't it? And I think it's also a, a novel writ written by a, a man who was probably instinctively much more a poet than a novelist. When I have that, you probably have that little selection of Lowry's mm. poems. Um, they're not very good poems. 
I don't think. I, I, I know there are lots of people who disagree with me about that. But they do belong very much to that, that period. And in a way, it, it may be the great novel of the apocalypse. Do you think of the, of the English apocalyptic period? Can you think of any other really superlative novels from that period, which would be the, fir the first half, I guess, of the Burgess period? Given more time, I probably could, but but <laughs> certainly, as apocalyptic novels go, this is mm. this is probably the most apocalyptic. Mm. I mean, it ends with a dead dog. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, you don't get much more apocalyptic. But what's that. neat about it too, it being as an apocalyptic novel, is that there is no huge scientific or technological apocalypse. Is there? It's no. it's it's all psychological, cultural. Mm. Uh, it's all man-made, if you like, not um, not generated by machines or science it is mm. yeah and and this the sense of doom mm. right from i mean in the the first uh, or the second chapter i think it is mm. he gets run over by a car because yes. he's drunk and crossing the road and from then on the sense of doom in the novel yes. is, is just overwhelming <laughs> and i don't particularly want to ruin it but you're sure that the alcohol is going to kill him the yeah. amount that he's yeah. drinking and that may not be the case when you get to the end of the novel <laughs> but he will he will survive forever because he'll be pickled won't he yes he'll be yeah. discovered discovered as a totally totally preserved like some of those strange saints in naples mm. you know <laughs> burgess says that the under the volcano belongs to the tradition which began with ulysses which we've talked about before the, the sort of modernist period you obviously agree with him um but do you think Lowry can be viewed as an experimental novelist in the same way Joyce can. No, I think Joyce was a Joyce was utterly lucid in his relationship to form, and Lowry's struggle, draft after draft after draft with his books, means to me that he never really got clear in his own head what the structure of the novel was going to be. There is one of he's got these three epigraphs at the beginning, and and there there there's one is I, I can't can't remember what the other two are. There's um. There is one by um, Sophocles and one from Goethe, but the middle one is from John Bunyan, from uh, Grace Abounding for the Chief of Sinners. And it seems to me, that we talked about the absence of religious uh, content, if you like, but there is a strong sense of damnation. And Faust, of course, is there as well, isn't he? Um, but this passage is really, really astonishing. It's, it says, Now I blessed the condition of the dog and toad, yea, gladly would I have been in the condition of the dog or horse, for I knew they had no soul to perish under the everlasting weight of hell or sin, as mine was like to do. Nay, and though I saw this, felt this, and was broken to pieces with it, yet that which added to my sorrow was that I could not find with all my soul that I did desire deliverance. I could not find with all my soul that I did desire deliverance. Not, not unlike Faust. Um, and um, I think that's really, really powerful. And I think that does inform the, the as it were, the deeper levels, assuming there are deeper levels in under the volcano, this, this really strong sense of a man who is, understands his damnation and pursues it. Um, you know, he could, he could withhold, he could, um, he could fight against it, but he doesn't, he pursues it. And I guess maybe, maybe that's why I, I, though I lose patience with the book, I, I, I still, you know, I still can. It's very much up, up there in my my own memory uh, as a as an experience. Um, it it runs against against the moral the moral current that it it actually proposes, I rather like that wonderful passage. I, I suppose that that's uh, kind of made clear. There's there's one tiny little possibility of redemption when Yvonne his estranged wife tells him we should go and get a house mm. by the sea and live our days there with no booze and, yeah you know we'll be in love and and Jeffrey the consul sort of says yes that sounds good let's mm. go now and that's just before everything goes, oh, it's, goes it's wrong yes yeah yeah and of course, that is in a way the life he achieved in Canada, wasn't it? Mm. When he was when he was there, working on, on partly on this book. Yeah, see, it is funny. I wonder if it's true that he really did believe that 
you know, follow that passage in in Grace Abounding. Hmm. <laughs> We're sort of reaching the end of our conversation about about Lowry. What what do you think the legacy of Under the Volcano is today? And and uh, do you think Lowry in general, his fiction, his poetry, has resonated with any writers working today? There are writers like Cormac McCarthy, who I think um, I mean he's he's so many stages beyond. <laughs> beyond Lowry, but in a way, the the horrible roads that he travels down are Lowry roads, and they're, they're in that in that kind of psychology as well. And I think there are writers who write beyond, as it were, beyond the extremes that we normally expect a, a writer to write that that have learned from Lowry. Um, I just wish that Under the Volcano had um, had proposed a style. Maybe the fact that it doesn't propose a style makes it a resource for writers who, are, who have the style. So there are, I think, a lot of people have learned from him. Uh, I think probably some of the Latin American writers possibly, like, uh, well, maybe even Fuentes, but certainly Marquez and people like that uh, almost certainly have learned from him. And if there were two traditions and Marquez was one aspect and uh, Borges was the other aspect, you know, the Marquez uh, aspect would be indebted to Lowry and the Borges would be repelled by Lowry. But then the Borges is the more European, in a curious way. Yes, I guess maybe one of the things Lowry was trying to escape from was the weight of uh, English tradition and confinement and so on. And and one way out would be to give himself over to sensuality, and what the other was to just destroy his mind with, uh, his character's minds with, with alcohol. I, I think I, maybe the thing that I've, find most difficult with Lowry is that I always think he's writing about himself. Um, uh, and those bits that you mentioned, which are very vivid, you step out of himself into the world and you see the world, and then, then soon you relapse into into this consciousness, which is very... There's not much room for your own breath in there, is there? You know? No, certainly in the, in the final chapter yeah. when Jeffrey is in a, in a bar drinking heavily, very heavily... And he's surrounded by sort of Mexican gangsters mm. and and old ladies and pimps, chickens, <laughs> and that <laughs> yes, sort right. of thing. Um, it's suffocating. Yeah, the yeah. way he writes that is suffocating. Yeah. And and the protagonist, the consul, mm. sort of the the way it's being narrated through his eyes sort of sucks mm. the air out of the the room. And whether or not that's a conscious choice that he's made or whether that's what his mindset was mm. when he was writing mm. that chapter. It's certainly uh, the way the novel ends is, yeah. is suffocating. It is. Um, and again, you're mentioning Dante is very interesting because it goes in the opposite direction, doesn't it? Mm. You, you don't begin in heaven, but you you certainly end in hell. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And and the novel name checks uh, Malabolge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, frequently, mm. which is the is it that the lowest? That's right. Of yes, yes. He's so the one who's... that's the sort of destination mm. for Vermin. That's right. And the, that's where you mm. know, Dante starts, yeah. isn't it? It's under under the volcano, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My final question, uh, which we ask for ask everybody that we interview for this podcast, uh, is if you could round up Burgess's list to a hundred, which book would you add? And why? It's the period. Remind me of the period again. It doesn't have to stick with the period. It's oh, nineteen thirty nine to nineteen eighty four. But the one book I would add to any list of that kind. Well, no, and they, there are many in translation, aren't there? These are all books in English, but you can mention a book in translation. Well, uh, the, one of the books in translation would be Natalia Ginsburg's uh, Family Sayings, um, which she has a wonderful habit and very anti Lowry, if you like, of. Uh, feeling that we, she, she she wrote a life of Manzoni, and and the character in Family Sayings is the protagonist. You never see her, and she's just basically constructing the whole novel out of um, the fam, family sayings. So there's a kind of space in the middle which is her cut out, as it were, and she's hearing and hearing all these things, and gradually you get a very strong sense of her without her being there. In the Manzoni family. Um, uh, it's about Manzoni, the great Italian writer. But she builds the whole novel out of the people around him, the people surrounding him. So like in Velasquez's great painting of, uh, you know, the Las Meninas, the, the royal family is looking, looking, and the painter's at the back painting, and you don't see the king and queen, 
but you see what they see, which is their empire. You don't see them, you see what they see, which I think is the most brilliant bit of uh, magic. And the other, the other novel I would put in any list, um, Ginsburg was from the 60s, 50s to 80s, I guess, uh, would be Moby Dick by Herman Melville, my novel which is inexhaustible. There's also also a book which is much more, much more Lowry-esque, which is Rabelais, the, you know, Gargantua and Pantagruel, but translated by that. that I don't. Do, there's a very wonderful translation by a, by the man who did the Honorable Crichton, and I can't remember his name at the moment. Um, in any event, it's it's a, a most stunning translation from from. Uh, it must have been the sixteen hundred and something, fifteen something, and. Uh, when I was talking to a friend of mine who was at Cambridge at the time when uh, Ted Hughes and so on were up, and he was a great friend of Hughes's, he said, yes, when he was at Cambridge, everyone was reading that translation. And this particular book, this particular translation, had a huge impact on Hughes and Plath and Gunn and others. Uh, and it's curious that it's almost never mentioned. But um, it, it's something that I think, I think Burgess would have loved and probably knew very well. I, I think he did. And, yeah. um I've just recorded a podcast about Falstaff by oh, Robert yes. Nye, oh, and yes. that that book came up. Yes. Rabelais came yeah, up a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we we will put the the translation in the description of oh, this good, episode, good, good. so um, people will know it. It's all of my book on the novel. I, I quote extensively from it. It's one of those books where there, there's a battle scene, and somebody lops off the top of somebody's head, and the action stops. And Rabelais, who was himself a physician, looks in and describes the in interior of the skull. And then the action starts again. It's, well, it's just magic. It's so surprising and very hilarious um, and very cruel and um, not very friendly to the church or, or to the state. <laughs> well, that's a, an excellent choice, a very Burgessian choice. Michael, thanks for joining us on the 99 Novels podcast. It's been a, a great delight to hear, hear your take on Under the Volcano and your suggestions for, <laughs> for books to read. Thank you. You've been listening to 99 Novels, a podcast by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. Michael Schmidt's latest collection of poetry, Talking to Stanley on the Telephone, is out now from Smith Doorstop. The novel, a biography by Michael Schmidt, is out now from Harvard University Press. You can find out more about Carcanet Press and PN Review at carcanet.co.uk. For more information about Anthony Burgess and to find out how you can support the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit anthonyburgess.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.